Square Ball Podcast. Hello there, welcome to the show, The Square Ball, along with Phil Hay from The Athletic. Michael's here as well. Dan on hosting duties. We've got some exciting sponsorship news coming up in some in the coming weeks, Michael, haven't we? Am I, have I got another line? Because if I'm if I'm having to deal with multiple things, it's it's a company that you know. I think you've um, you've hoard off their stuff before. I think is the, is the I mean, right I, way to do describe it. You know, I was going to say that I was going to throw in. You've had freebies off before, yeah. just by chance, and it turns out it's true. Yeah. yeah. So they'll be coming, they'll be, they'll be coming into clean up in uh, <laughs> oh, <I see. laughs> who could that be in coming weeks? Anyway, people are going to be astonished when they find out. Yeah, I wonder who that'll be. Um, Phil, right? So this is the back end of the week show where we have a little chat about that. The press conference, we preview the game. The West Brom game is coming up on Friday night. Um, again, timestamping it as this is Thursday lunchtime as we record, so anything could happen. Do you, do you want to talk about the game, given that um, Farker wasn't asked about it at all well, in this, his press conference yesterday? This was going to be maybe, my jump. Maybe we should. My jump know. off point is that it's so funny, isn't it, that nobody spoke about the, the upcoming game in the press conference because everything's been all consuming. Because, like, you know, how do you talk about you know, West Brom are going to have up front or even Carlos Corbran or whatever? when you find out that there are potential legal disputes with the, your first team squad and they're training on their own. How do you reminisce about Kyle Bartley and Alex Mowat? Um, it's also so early in the season that everybody kind of realises that the games at this point aren't really going to dictate how the season goes, what's more likely to dictate how the season goes. Um are things like transfers and sales and the structure of the squad and everything else, which is clearly not right and, and clearly needs work. Yeah, it's... It's just incredibly complicated at the moment, isn't it? And and everything seems to be very complicated. And it's kind of like if you've, you've got good news and then you've got, if not bad news, you've got kind of opaque news. So on the one hand, it's become clear this week that the release clauses that are left in the squad, and we're talking predominantly now about Tyler Adams and Lewis Sinistera, I would imagine that there is one in Junior Furpo's contract as well, but Furpo is injured and, and won't be back until after the end of the the, the transfer window. Come so, on, and his junior, and his junior Furpo. Some, Let's also on. be clear about this. Come on, somebody, somebody activate it. Come Someone on, someone who's watched him. Well, what I would say is that I don't get the impression that people are sat at home sweating about Furpo's release clause, whereas there's obviously been a lot of stress about um, Adams' release clause and Sinistera's, and I do think what has probably tipped the balance. Uh, the mood somewhat um, and perhaps broken the camel's back is the fact that Harrison was the one who left on loan over the weekend. And I think whereas there are players who have gone that people won't lament their departure, um, there are other players who they would have liked to have seen stayed. And, and evidently the club wanted Verba to stay and he hasn't. They would have liked to have kept Harrison. Harrison is probably a player they could have made profit on, but he's gone on loan because um, Everton were able to trigger the the clause in his contract that let him do that. So people are understandably frustrated. So these contracts have elapsed. Uh, the, the clauses in them have elapsed now. Um, players are still at the club. But as Farkas said yesterday, there is obviously some wrangling with Sinistera about what exactly the clause amounted to. He's training alone at the moment. Um, Farka wouldn't comment on whether he'd expressly asked to leave, but I think that would be a fairly safe yeah, conclusion to draw that he wanted to. Yeah, I was going to say, if there's a dispute about a clause in a contract that allows you to yes. leave, it's probably that he wants y to leave. Yeah. Well, well, otherwise, why would you waste your time arguing about it? You know, I don't want to activate this, but I do actually want cl you know, <laughs> Some clarity about it so, you know, so I can <laughs> sleep at night. Um, non to obviously training alone is different in the sense that he has no release clause. So that is one where the club are just taking a hard line and saying you won't be sold no matter what happens, you, you are going to stay. That last week was Nonto really trying to engineer a way out, given that he has no mechanism to do it. Uh, so there is obviously something that needs resolved with Sinistera. Um, we have been told from the Bournemouth end that Bournemouth think they activated Adam's clause on Monday, or at least made a bid that would have gone close. Um, and you would think, given that the clause is pretty self-explanatory, they would have hit it right on the button. Um, but he is still here. He was at Thorpe Arch yesterday. Um, he hasn't gone at this stage. It's all rather opaque, really. And there is now this scenario where you could actually see Sinistera Adams and Nonto all being at the club at the end of the window, but evidently some question marks as well. I mean, Fark is the only one who seems to be talking, if not completely openly, as near as damn it. Well, I, th I think he is talking very openly in, in as much as when he doesn't want to answer a question, he's saying, basically saying, look, 
there is more to say about this and there's more I could say about it, but I'm not going to. You know, he's not lying to us in any way. He's not trying to swerve away from... You know, with, with Nonto last week, for example, it was made pretty apparent, I thought, at the press conference after Shrewsbury by Farker that there was an issue because he wasn't pretending that Nonto was injured. He wasn't pretending that it was a family matter or, you know, a personal issue that was nothing to do with football or nothing to do with, with contracts. You could tell that there was a problem there and then subsequently the statement about Nonto made that a bit more clear. And likewise with Sinistera over the weekend, Sinistera does have an issue with one of his knees, but I don't think anybody is pretending that there was nothing, no transfer aspect to this either. Um, and Farker said yesterday, you know, he's, he's not able to concentrate on his football, he's not able to focus fully, therefore he's out of the dressing room, he's training at different times to the squad, he's not in our sessions. He and um, Nonto are basically both ostracised at this stage. Hilda Costa too, except Hilda Costa is totally different. He wants to leave. The club want him to leave. Nobody's bothered about Costa particularly. He doesn't really come into this conversation. But it's, yeah, it, it's really, really complex and really complicated. And there can't be a club that are that have so much to do in what is left of the window, but are more desperate for the window to close. And I think Farker will be almost happier than anybody else, any other manager, to be able to get to September and to know exactly where he stands with his squad. I know it's it's barely been a story. You gonna are you gonna talk about your bad knees here, by the way? Because as soon as Phil mentioned it, I did worry. I thought, oh god, I'm no, gonna no, trigger no. Michael. Not not yet, not yet. Helder Costa, like he's not old. We paid a lot of money for him. Why why are we just going off oh, whatever? Put him out with the put him out with the bins. There, there doesn't seem to be any massive interest in him. So he was in um the Middle East last season I think you'll go back to the Middle East He's, before it was fashionable yeah yeah or, or as it was starting to get a bit more fashionable but yeah he was ahead of the curve wasn't he, he was yeah. a, bit of a bit of a trendsetter um his contract's starting to run down he hasn't been involved for ages um I don't think you're telling me that you're hoping Costa will suddenly come to the fore and play I, I sort of think moving him on kind of makes sense I, I would say that but then I also would have said the same about people like Jamie Shackleton and Ian Pervada over the summer. I was going to say, did you watch the Birmingham game, Phil? And, and, he, you, look, and you do look at that squad and you think, well, he maybe wasn't quite everything we'd hoped he'd be when we signed him, wasn't Costa, but he was a footballer. But the... the, 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 the <laughs> that's, that's the criteria. He, he, he would have filled, yeah. would have filled yeah. a seat on the bench that, you know, Chris Clarson was taking. But the, the Birmingham game is a slight red herring in the sense that you have made the decision weeks and weeks earlier that Costa isn't training with you, he's not uh, training with the first-team squad, he's leaving, you're all agreed. Then you get to the Birmingham game and Nonto isn't travelling, Sinistera isn't travelling, you've got Shackleton on, on the right-hand side. You can't suddenly say, actually, just chuck Hilda in and, and let him play. You made your bed with that one and, and he, he has to go. Sinistera and Nonto were big losses for that game. And the, the odd thing about that match was that Leeds were incredibly weak and I looked at the lineup and thought, well, they're really exposed here and they'll do well to get anything from it. But actually, it it was a tight game and it wasn't as if the one there wasn't the potential for somebody talented like a non or a Sinistera to turn that and win it. You know, it, it, irrespective of how well Leeds played. You know, it was that sort of game where it was just kind of waiting for a foul on Ethan Laird or you know, a mistake, a little bit of magic, whatever, to settle what was a, a pretty poor match overall. And that I, I feel a lot of sympathy for Farke at the moment. I, I I like him. I think he's been as diplomatic as he can be in the sense that he's not glossing over things, but he's not being wildly defeatist either. He's not sitting there and saying, we have no chance at the moment. I mean, he did he did kind of say, this game's going to be a bit tricky on Friday. You know, he's, he, he did slip that in and I think that's probably the case. But he is trying to be optimistic. And I think as well, he's trying to push this line of, you know, I wasn't expecting it to be perfect at the outset. I think in his head, he'll be thinking to himself, hopefully I can look back at this in six months, 12 months, 18 months time and laugh about the way it was because things are so much better. Only Sunderland, says Johnny Cooper, who is excellent, works for Opta. Johnny, um, JR Cooper, 26 on Twitter, uh, has supplied us with a bunch of facts here going into this game. So thank you, Johnny, for that. Um, we're going to have some regular um, input from Johnny across the season. Only Sunderland... Um, at 23 years and 23 days, have named a younger average lineup in the championship so far this season than Leeds, which is 23 years and 364 days. So just a fraction under 24 years average age for the teams that we've played, which tells us tells you all you need to know, doesn't it? Well, it, it tells you really that that, that team, I'm not saying Farker doesn't use young players because he definitely does and he did at Norwich, but that team 
was almost picked by default on Saturday. You know, it almost picked itself on the basis of who else was there. And in the end, you had Rodon making his debut and really playing as a centre forward because Leeds were trying to dig out an, an equaliser. Um, they do have a, a lot of injuries. And if the squad was fit that, and from front to back, then it would be different. Um, and if you didn't have Nonta refusing to travel and if you didn't have Sinistera refusing to travel um, or not being in the squad, then... Again, your, your hand would be would be strengthened, but you know, Farker keeps saying we need players. We we need players in. He was he, he was almost its tone yesterday. Almost made it sound as if they might have reached a, a kind of turn in the road, and he was almost implying that things are going to get better from here. And he was pretty confident that they were possibly done with the outgoings um, or the outgoings that they wanted to avoid. That new players might be on the way before long. They've got to be on the way before long because it's. August the 17th as we talk now um, but there was just a little bit more kind of optimism I think in what he was saying about the fact that it has been difficult but maybe maybe it is going to improve Two weeks Phil Yes um, Farka said we've got enough time we need to move quickly though don't we Yes um, I think whether they've got enough time will be proven by what we what they serve up by the end of the window Do we have enough money? Because <laughs> I get the impression when we came down the board probably imagined we would have sold some players for some money by this stage, whereas we've got three and a half million for Rodrigo, which won't even probably cover his payment, the remaining payments on him. Yeah. So there's very little profit there. That That's the way that Farka always couches it. The problem is he sees it is not necessarily that some players can go on loan. It's that there is no money coming back in. You know, they're not raking in big fees um, for anybody. Therefore, it's not giving them um, money to play with in the transfer market. My impression of where they're at, and I think Dan's spoken about this as well, and I think you're right, is that cash isn't a problem for the club, but PNS and financial fair play and the limits within that mean that there's a definite limit to what they can do. Because the there market. is a big question around this, isn't there? And it's one of those conversations I've seen swirling around everywhere because everybody's trying to understand why we found ourselves in the position that we have. And, and the, the likely explanation is probably a combination of things, of the contract clauses, of the um, the financial fair play or profit and sustainability, as it's called now, position. And everyone's debating. It's like, are we are we right up against the PNS limit? Because we've got two years of Premier League limit plus one year of EFL limit, which comes out, I think it's 83, 83 million losses you're allowed to make over that three-year rolling period. Um, and that is baked into the EFL rules, by the way, the the financial fair play position from the Premier League carries over for, for those two years. So we've got two in the bank for the Premier League. This year will be under EFL guidelines, which is a lot lower. So it's 35 million losses, 35 million losses, and it's 13 this year, isn't it? Of which 8 million can be made up by um, money put in by 49ers Enterprises. I The impression you get from the club is that the PNS limit is a challenge, um, if not necessarily stopping them from doing anything. There is a massive difference between a club being skint. And sometimes a club are skint, therefore they can't afford to do anything, you know, can't afford to buy anybody or do any business because they don't have any money. And a club that do have money but are not able to go any further than the limits let them go. And you'll, you'll remember the, the coverage of Newcastle once the Saudi money first came in there. And the, the way in which it was painted where people said, even if they have all the wealth in Saudi Arabia, and they certainly have some of it, they aren't just able to do Mbappe. And they aren't just able to start, you know, forking out for everybody and anybody because there are limits, you know, there are limits to what they can spend before they start breaching FFP and are, and are held in breach by the Premier League. As Chelsea prove. <laughs> but but Chelsea, are, Chelsea are the perfect example of the, I guess, the struggle and the inability of people like us to, to know for sure how any of this works or how it is that you sneak within the limits, even though you seem to be spending way beyond the limits, um, how it is that you cut down on what we cl- what we count for PNS, how you avoid it. It's incredibly complicated. Um, and there's no doubt at all, I don't think, that the length of contracts that are getting signed at Chelsea, I and mean, what was the, what was the, um, the one for um, Casado? Eight, eight years. Eight years with a one-year option. So you're signing, signing somebody for nine years. And how many people stay at a club for nine years? You but know? The, re- the reason for that is because it allows them to account for the transfer fee. Because the Premier exactly. League rules don't match the yeah. FIFA rules. So the FIFA rules, the UEFA ones, have just been changed. So it's a maximum of five years. But for the Premier League, 
it's still not being tightened up in that regard. So it means that they can account for that transfer fee in the book, on the books, regardless of how they're paid for it in, re- in real world terms. Exactly. And I don't even want to get yeah. into this again because it no, it's just boring and stupid. But, but this is why it's they're so hard. They're, they're absolutely rinsing the system is what I'm saying. Yeah, so, yeah. but this is why so, it's so, so there are, hard. There are, the point is, Phil, there are ways around it. And it there feels are. like, why, why are we sticking to it so religiously when... Um, there are examples within the football world of clubs who don't. There are also plenty of examples of clubs who get punished for breaching it. And there are these questions, I think particularly with Chelsea at the, the moment, where everybody sits and says, how are they doing this? And even if they are able to do this via FFP, doesn't that maybe suggest that FFP needs a rework and a, yeah. re, a rethink? But there'll, you know? there'll be Leeds fans who'll be listening and, and, and listening to this and watching this saying, well, just roll the dice, take the gamble, go back up and to hell with the consequences, pay the fine like everybody else does. I suppose the yeah. game the game to look at there is Derby against Villa in the playoffs because they were both teams that were well in breach of financial fair play stuff and look where they both ended up. So that's why you, you can go either way on it, can't you, mm. if you, if you take the gamble. And yeah, no, abs- absolutely can gamble, 100%. But that's, that, that is a decision for the people who run the club, isn't yeah. it? And from- Gamble. Gamble, gamble. <laughs> <laughs> Risk everything. I mean, what you've just done there, that is essentially the whole advertising motif of football these days, isn't it? <laughs> but I, I do understand, though, why people look at... I don't want to use Chelsea as the only example, but people look at um, the deal with Brighton and how much it's worth. Painted as £115 million. And, and I'm given the impression that in eight years' time that will still be featuring in the accounts from a deal that was done 2023, but in 2031, that is still spread out at that point. I mean, possibly not, because obviously at some stage they might sell him and he, and he might go. But in theory, that's what happens. So how the how the average person, and, and a lot of journalists too, are supposed to be able to sit and say, what's the PNS position? You basically have to ask a club, is the PNS position okay? They will say, yes, no, somewhere in the middle. Yes, you can do sort of calculations, rough calculations, but even the accounts don't allow you to see the picture right at the moment. So it's um it's very very it's very very complicated. It is very opaque. But also, what you're finding in the EFL is that clubs who have been here for a while are getting more and more frustrated about parachute payments and the fact that clubs coming down have the advantage of parachute payments. So in no way are the EFL inclined to make it easier or any easier, or at least other championship clubs inclined to make it any easier for teams who are getting relegated. Yeah, and if there's a club they're going to make an example of, as we know from the peering through the, <laughs> peering through the fence do, scenario. Do you, know, do you know what we had on Saturday? The first chant of the Football League's corrupt. Really? It was like going back in time now. I was like, oh yeah, I've forgotten about that one. What, what's that about then? What's the, the grievance for that? I think there was a refereeing decision that wasn't uh, uh, okay. particularly popular. <sighs> Seems fair. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just going back to the point we were making, like it, it's the lack of communication around these things that mean fans go around in circles on it and just fill the yeah. gap. You know, as yeah. we've always said, nature hates a vacuum, so it gets filled with noise. And I think what I do like about Farker is that he, you know, he said yesterday, I'm here for the sport, which was kind of ironic because the sport does seem to be what happens when the politics takes a breather for a bit. It's like, oh, you can, you can play a game now. Um, but he isn't trying to avoid discussing this stuff. There are some things where, like I said, you know, initially with Nonto and a little bit with Sinistera as well, he doesn't want to go the whole hog. But he is doing his best, I think, to try and say to people, this is how it is. I had a few people get in touch with me saying, oh, you, you seemed like you were really mad when we did the show on Monday. And I was like, I'm not... I think you were really mad. No, I'm not. You, you, you watched it back. What do you think, back. Michael? Has he been, has he been raging <laughs> well, this you, week? You He's it. been awful to live with. <laughs> you watched it back, Phil, a bit of it. And you said, God, you seemed angry. So I'm not angry. <laughs> I'm just exasperated at why we make being a football club looks so dif- difficult all the time why is it why always us as uh, <laughs> as the shirt went yeah, I mean you touched on parachute payments there it does feel like we spent years in the championship bitching and moaning about other teams I mean parachute payments when well, you've come down and gone oh, it's a bloody nightmare I heard all this <laughs> <laughs> what are you supposed to do it's worse than before worst but, thing we ever did going up but then you obviously have transfer liabilities um, that are in your accounts and need dealt with so I was these, that, that's the problem isn't it we've, we've, talked, we've touched we've touched the parachute payments on buying loads of shit players who've now gone out on loan everybody just spends everything you know the money that comes in it's just gone nobody saves any of it some clubs you know will invest it in stadium or training ground or this that and the other but they the trend of just spending on your squad, you know, of wages going up, of fees going up. Um, it's interesting because I feel like there have been times where championship clubs have been much better placed to spend, not necessarily vastly bigger fees, but slightly bigger fees than we're seeing. 
this summer. I'll be very interested to see what the top whack is for a player signed to a championship club. I mean, Hamer at Coventry, who they did, they did try to go after, they did have a go at, couldn't meet Coventry's asking price. Sheffield United could, Premier League money. So he's he's gone to, to Sheffield United. He's gone there for £15 million. I, I, will, I will be genuinely interested to see what the top whack is for the most expensive signing in the championship um, this summer. It will be, I would think it will be around about 10 Something yeah. like that. It's going to be it's going to be us, Leicester, or Southampton, isn't it? You would think, and, and realistically, probably more likely to be Southampton or Leicester because they do seem to have, you know, big money coming in. And we don't. Not yet. Um, yeah, people always ask, "Where's the Premier League money gone?" And the truth is, it's all gone on wages and transfers, hasn't yeah. it? Really. Like, so if you do the basic maths of looking at what the wage bill was that we went down with, you're probably talking what 130 million, something yeah. like that. About 130 million on a 200 million turnover. Um, leaves you 70 million to play with once you start factoring transfer fees into it and then all your other miscellaneous costs for running a football ground and team and all that it's not right a lot is it actually you no, just, uh, just torch it all on players so quite often in the Premier League your wage bill will sit a little below or slightly above but around about um, your, your sort of total revenue it will not be too far off um, give or take if you have release clauses, as uh, sorry, um, wage reduction clauses for relegation as Leeds did, then it's slightly different. But say in the case of Leicester, who I don't think had any, you get relegated. Your wage bill sits at this, but your revenue drops like that because the TV money is, is so different. So it becomes a massive problem. And nobody really in the, the Premier League, and I suppose you could say that Leeds did kind of plan for this by doing wage reduction clauses, but very few clubs seem to think to themselves, you know, what are we actually going to do if we go down? It's, it always seems to be a case of... Oh, it's, deal with it deal with it as and when but it um, brings us back to that conversation once again of they have handed all the power in this situation or control of the situation if not power to the players and their agents by giving them all these loan clauses rather than saying fine you'll get this reduction but we'll put a, put you in at a release fee of this so at least it gives a little bit of control back to the club yeah but what happens if you say we'll, we'll have this wage reduction um, you'll get this uh, release clause with a fee and the player says not having that don't sign him. Yeah, it is what Farker said, you know. Um, but I think you have to accept that because of the, the power players do, the pool that you can fish in for players who will say, yeah, I'll absolutely have a wage reduction, but, you know, not really bothered about the release fee becomes smaller. Well, that's, that, it's all fine and well talking about these as theoretical examples, but yeah. I'm going to chuck the words Southampton and Leicester back at you and say they seem to be doing all right because they've both sold a couple of players for an absolute boatload of money. Yeah, absolutely. But they also had existing good players. You know, so Madison, been around for ages. Barnes, been around for ages. Lavia is different. Lavia is one they signed last summer, um, Southampton, whose value is appreciated. They made big money on him. Great deal, even though they got relegated. You know, that is a great transfer deal, that, because you, you've taken a lot of cash. Leeds have signed loads of players who are not worth significant money and whose value hasn't appreciated because last season was such a mess. The players didn't pay, um, play particularly well. There are exceptions to the rule. I think Adams probably held his value. Harrison, you know, would be worth more than the, the 11 million that Leeds paid for him. They would make a profit on Melier, I think. They'd make a profit on Nonto. But, you know, once you start going through Christensen and even Verba, Llorente, players like this, they, they're worth less than Leeds signed them. For, so the bigger picture is poor recruitment that has in no small way led to this. You mentioned Elan Melier there. Um, just five clean sheets in our last 52 matches. We've conceded 102 goals across those games. Um, start from Johnny Absolutely Cooper there. unbelievable. It's felt like that though, isn't it? You know, the idea that goals are just flying in all the time. Well, if, if Melier's value is depreciated versus what that... And, the, and the, the plan was probably to sell him this summer, wasn't it? But they probably hoped for like 40 or 50 million. Whereas, they, they certainly did a year ago, yeah. Yeah, well, whereas... Paul had been on the receiving end of 160 goals in two seasons. No surprises that his confidence is shot and he looks like he's had the yips for, for quite a while and um, it can't be good for a player, can it? Nope. nope. And, um, and, and, and no clean sheets in 18 consecutive matches, by the way, um, is also another stat that Johnny's uh, sent through, which matches a run between December 2021 and April 2022. Um, we had a longer run between October 2004 and January 2005. That was 19 in a row. Don't know if that's the record, but... Um, it's all good news. Yeah, so is that one thing we need to get out of Friday? Would a, would a clean sheet be an achievement at this stage? And who goes in net? I mean, we were very close at Birmingham, weren't we? It, I, that felt like it was very much headed for a nil-nil until the penalty, which I'm still not sure about. I don't know. I can't remember what you... Did, what did you say, Phil? Did you think I, it was I thought that was a penalty. Yeah. Nonsense. 
part, <laughs> part of the football league system. <laughs> yeah, the, the utter corruption from top to bottom. Yeah, no, I thought it was. I thought it was a penalty. Um, the the biggest problem has been as a team, and and when it comes to performance, the, the biggest problem has been the utter inability to keep clean sheets, to defend consistently, and. You need goal scorers. I think everybody looks at the team and says they need another nine. I actually think Leeds do th- feel they need another nine, and I do think that's something that, that we will see. Uh, but do they want to hurry you, up? You, uh, a number nine or nine players? Hopefully, uh, a number nine. Okay. Yeah. Um, but they cannot. They, they're not going to get anywhere with this defensive record staying as it is. And I know that they're in a different division now, but they are a club who are in the habit of shipping goals in the way that Melier is a, a goalkeeper who is in the habit of shipping an unbelievable number of goals. I mean, you're right. You just cannot, as a goalkeeper, you just cannot retain your highest level of confidence while it is just constantly fishing the ball out of the net. And we we had a close look at his stats last year and it was showing that he was conceding quite considerably more than he should be if you trust the, you know, the, XGOT, which I know is your favourite stat. Expected Game of Thrones, as we said at the yes. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would be great, that wouldn't it? Yeah, it's, that sounds like Leeds actually. Tits and yeah. Dragons, expected, apparently. Expected game, <laughs> expected Game of Thrones. How bonkers is it going to go this that, weekend? That is how Game of Thrones was once explained to me because I've never seen it. So I said, "What's it about?" You know, yeah, somebody just said to me, "Tits and Dragons." <laughs> yeah, basically, basically that. Yeah, basically that. So you know, he, he probably should have performed better. Um, definitely should have performed better. But um, the defence in front of him, or the structure in front of him, was. Pretty hopeless too. Do you put Rod on in? Uh, yes, yes, I think you do. Yeah, um, Strauch alongside him, obviously. Uh, probably more likely, given that one's right-footed, one's left-footed. Um, I don't think Creswell did a huge amount wrong at all at Birmingham. Would like to see um, Creswell play more, but I think Rodon, having come from Spurs, he's going to go into the team pretty pronto. And, and he definitely takes the box of Grizzle Championship bastard. I think you think so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the sort that we I want. think I think Ampadu does as well. I think Ampadu is potentially better than that, but he looks to me like um, hard enough and game enough and savvy enough to to mix it in this league for sure. Another one of the uh, the Johnny Cooper facts that he sent through that Strouk has completed the second most passes in the championship so far this season at two hundred and eleven, which is only twenty five fewer than Rotherham have done as a team. It, I noticed after the first game because I was having a look at Archie Gray and his. Um, passing stats touches because I wanted to see in the first game been really impressed with him and, and was against Cardiff and I wanted to see I had the, the impression of him being on the ball a lot and when you looked at the numbers um, it was clear that he had been but strike stood out straight away as you know the, the second, third, fourth highest number of passes Ailing, Ampadu, Gray um, on 74, 75, 76 and then he had strike who I think was on something like 132 and it's funny because in the game itself I hadn't kind of picked up on that amount of possession going through strike but it is something to look at because it does seem to be where the ball is going a lot mm. don't tell us bro <laughs> <laughs> their the analysts haven't bothered looking at <laughs> their analysts haven't bothered doing anything this week apart from listening <laughs> to this podcast yeah it's like I, I did enjoy the um, some of the discussion that surrounded you know when Max Ahrens ended up at Bournemouth mm, yeah um, and it was when the, the story obviously broke uh, that he was heading to Leeds potentially and that that was the thing that had alerted um, Bournemouth to his availability. And, and in no way was his agent maybe, you know, driving that. I think uh, people do think that it might work that way. What do you fancy for the for the West Brom game on Friday? Do you go into it with any hope or optimism based on what Farker said, based on what the, the way that things are? Just on the defence, actually, do you think drama might, might slot in for Ailing because he's not been very good? It, I, I looked at the reluctance with which you said that. Like, you don't want to... Like, I don't want to have a go at Ailing, but... Had he been a new signing, had Junior Furpo been doing Luke Ayling defending, I think people would be maybe losing their minds over it a bit. I do feel like he's having a difficult time, Ayling. Um, but he, he falls into the category, doesn't he, of players who've given the club really, really good service. So you know, looking at Ayling, that it's not deliberate. It's not about application. It's not about anything like that. He did have the misfortune on Saturday at Birmingham of being up against the only player that looked like doing anything on the pitch that was Dembele. It was Dembele who pretty much turned it towards the end. I think it's a fair fair question to ask. I think it's a fair point of discussion. What Farke has said about Drammy so far is that he hasn't been fit enough, basically. He's had this hamstring problem, so he hasn't been at a point ready to to play and, and to be involved. But I think these are the decisions that are starting to come up now. In the, in the same way, and Hilda won't be involved because he has concussion, Um picked up in training but I think Byron was coming into that position anyway wasn't he after yeah. the, the first couple of games you know that felt felt kind of natural it it does need to settle down now if Rodon is going to play a lot get him into the team if Byron is going to be left back get him in there goalkeeper wise 
it feels like Melly at the moment has the honour. Um, but as I've said before, it's hard to see that at some point that isn't going to switch over to, to Darlow. When you take a step back from it, when you look at all those different pieces there, it almost feels like changing the defence has been quite high on the priority list because I presume we must be looking at a left back in some capacity. There's Byram who can do both. We were going to get Aaron's. You've got Rodon coming in at centre back. There's a lot of change there, isn't there? I, I think they'll try and do another full back. Um, keep eyes on Charlie Taylor at Burnley because they have been looking at him. Um, Talking of um, players who sit football out and refuse to play. Yes. I always <laughs> felt it was a bit different with Taylor, didn't you? Yeah, I think with the passing of time, you understand these things a little bit more. And he has since done an interview saying, look, I was uh, naive, young, yeah. And, and, yeah. and made a bad decision. The, the, and, and, and let's not forget that Gary Monk completely threw him under the bus with that as well. Yeah. And also, it wasn't as if Taylor was forcing his way out of the club. He was a game away from being a free agent. And yeah. so he just didn't want to get himself injured into anybody who sort of thinks, oh, well, he should have, you know, should just have played anyway. Look at Berardi against Derby. You know, it like, can happen, can it? It yeah. absolutely can yeah. happen. And as much as it doesn't very often, you know, Berardi getting a serious injury like that was just absolutely the sod's law scenario that quite often develops there. So I think it's a bit, a bit different with Taylor. And I, I look at Taylor and I just think he, he's just a very good left back yeah. for the championship. Particularly, so, you know, yeah, GBC, definitely. Like Max Adams, I think Max Adams would have been a really, really good signing. Um, I'd have been but instead he's a little, happy. He's a little turncoat very bastard. Very happy with that. Didn't he get injured at the weekend? He was taken off, wasn't he, towards the back end of the game, sort of in the last... You messaged me and said oh, he got injured today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, But I don't know how serious it was because he's now dead to me. So <laughs> not interested in his career anymore. <laughs> would have loved him if he came here. Nope. Um, our last home win on a Friday was against West Ooh. Brom yeah I'm guessing yeah March 2019 4-0 um, our last home <laughs> oh what a night that was oh, our last home Friday game in front of fans was on Good Friday against Wigan yeah the awful game <sighs> Yeah, yeah, and Johnny actually in the in the information that Johnny has put, he's put lost two one, still not over it. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever know what went on that day. No. It was the most, well, almost eclipsed by the Derby second leg. But that Wigan game was almost. It felt like looking on, it should be unlosable. You know, like you can't actually possibly lose this game, particularly because they were such a good team. Weird, yeah, and our, la- our last Friday game at all was December twenty twenty behind closed doors against West Ham. The amazing thing about that 4 0 against West Brom was that they'd lost at QPR on the Tuesday night. And that was the night when Bielsa was pictured in the tunnel, you know, crouched down, staring at the ground. And there was the press conference afterwards, and someone asked him, um, you know, are you, are you burning out? And he, he properly bit on that and, you know, was, was saying, it's just not a, it's not a thing. If you look at our stats and you look at everything else, no, we're not burning out. Um, so this kind of went on for the next couple of days. And then it was a big game against West Brom because they were, they were writing for promotion as well. And they turn up. Hernandez scores that goal after what twelve seconds, top corner, bang! Just Amazing perfect. night that was, yeah. wasn't it? Oh, a beautiful Wonderful. moment! Yeah. Did we do the guide to that? We did, we did the guide, which you can find on our feed. Certainly, we've done a show about it, haven't we? I can't remember if we did. I've just talked about it. Yeah, it was it was magic, wasn't it? Just just the perfect start, just answering answering all those questions. Missed that bloody goal. Did you? Not in the ground here. Packing, <laughs> packing mags back in your car. Ah. Yeah. <sighs> Just one, sorry, I just missed one of the best moments. <laughs> well, speaking of, of speaking of Bielsa, my final um, Johnny Cooper fact for today is: since Leeds sacked Bielsa in February 2022, the only team that's been ever present in England's top four tiers with fewer league wins than Leeds, who have 11, is Southampton with eight. So that just just goes to show what a diet of shite we've su- survived on for 11 wins. Blame me. And like when you start to actually months. go through some of those wins as well, you know, like one of them was against Southampton under Gracia, which was a real grind of a of a victory. Um, yeah. Slim pickings. What was the uh, the five clean sheets stat you you, you mentioned earlier? Um, where are we looking? Uh, five clean sheets. I'm sure you mentioned something like Melly has only got five clean sheets in the last two Le- seasons. Leeds or have something. kept just five clean sheets in the last 52 matches, 52 matches. conceding 102 goals in the process. It's prompting me to prompting me to look at the 96, 90, uh, 97 season where we kept five cl- five clean sheets in a row. Yeah, oh God, that season. How many goals, goals did we score in that season? Was it 40 something? I think it was. I think it was 30. Something, but yeah, we uh, we we had two 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 nil wins followed by three nil nils <laughs> yeah, in I mean, a row. Can, was that George Graham? Yeah, yes. yeah, you can't win, can you? Everybody moaned about his um, defensive football. Now you get a plethora of goals. Nobody's happy with that either. Yeah, we um, it was a it was a difficult season. It was ninety six ninety seven? But then again, that was the season, wasn't it, when we had the Derby four three? Where oh, yeah, went that. that no, that was after. Or was it the season after? That was the fun season. Oh, right, this okay. was just nil nils. <laughs> yeah. Just every been, week. There must have been no jeopardy in that season at all. Like, towards the end of it, people must have been turning up thinking, 
Uh, probably not be any goals in this. Well, I was going to say, if, you, if you've gone to the Wikipedia page and look at it, it's got all the you know the game-by-game game mm-hmm. breakdown of it, and there's a column on the right-hand side for scorers, and God, it's so sparse. <laughs> Brian Dean, Lee Sharp, joint, joint top scorers with five. Ooh. Yeah. And we had, yeah, so yeah, in that run of five clean sheets, yeah, three nil-nils on the bounce. I mean, Thank wow. You. And that was just that, and that was leading into Christmas as well, when everyone's trying to be happy and, you know. That this, was, is, this is the thing, you see, Leeds just never did nil-nils under Bielsa, ever. I'm not saying there were none. But you never ever went into a game thinking we never probably be dull and goalless. Today. We certainly never played for one, did we? No. Whereas George no. Graham, you got the impression certainly away games you'd be like, "Yep, this could be nil nil, <laughs> absolutely perfect." <laughs> you get echoes of that in Farker, don't you? The sense that he wants to go out there and take games by the scruff of the neck and win them. And, I think so. And do it, I think you know, so. controlling the possession. Yeah, as I, as I said at the, at the beginning, I, I think I think he's pragmatic enough to know that this summer has maybe not been has maybe been even more complicated than he thought it might be but it wasn't going to be simple it wasn't going to be straightforward it wasn't like fertile ground to come in and just you know smash the championship to bits but I think he does feel that as time goes on and as he gets further down the line um, that he'll, he'll get a grip of this it, it will, will start to come good the, the, the worry is always just the reality of football that if results don't get going at some stage um, and some stage fairly soon it becomes difficult doesn't it do you yeah. think the off-pitch stuff has actually helped Farker in that respect do you think it's it's bought him more time I, th- I think it definitely has I I, I seem to, I sense a lot of support for him really I, I get the feeling that people like him like what he's saying that they do have faith in his ability to build a, a championship team and I think it would be it would be fairly unfair to say you should be doing better with the players that you have I and mean, we're only two games in it's funny someone said to me today West Brom have had a mixed start haven't they and I was saying well they've only had two games so they've won one they've lost one but I don't know if that I don't know if two games is enough to, to define a, a start um, but he he won't want a bad first month at all and and suddenly actually the first month doesn't look that easy does it like Cardiff and Birmingham I think two really really average teams but West Brom have been decent under Corbin Ipswich if you if you want to be second, have a look at Ipswich's form um, over the past however many games going back into last season. I mean, they have been wildly consistent in a good way. Got to show you what momentum does, though, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah um, it does. Just that yeah. sense of like we we've been in this spiral downwards that needs it needs arresting, and I think that's maybe been the problem, hasn't it, with the with the early weeks of this season? It, it feels like we haven't got to grips with that. Like, and that's why Don't I was feel op- like a clean slate. Does yeah, it? I was optimistic going into the Cardiff game when we did the live stream and the, we did the preview of that. Think it's a new start now. It's kind of a, a line in the sand moment. And then actually, when we when you got there and saw some of the same like defensive deficiencies, and it's like, oh no, we haven't, it hasn't really changed all that much, has it? We've just lost a lot of players. Whatever and, happened, and we're, and we're still relying on familiar players to dig us out of this. Whatever happened to that four 0 graphic? No, that was just a, I, that was just me testing out the the font on the screen. That was all it was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear me! But yeah, it, it hasn't feel like we've we haven't arrested fully arrested that slide yet, and I think that's what is contributing towards maybe the um, the, the mindset of the fans at the minute is just this frustration that like it feels like this tailspin that we got ourselves into over the last eighteen months, whatever two years, has not stopped just yet, and people want to see a sign of of control. And actually, the one real symbol of control is Farker and the fact that he's, yeah. he's quite cool-headed about yeah, it Yeah, I think so. It's not as if he hasn't transmitted the message that it might not be simple um, from the outset. But I think the problem to this point is that we have had some signings. So we've had Ampadu, we've had Rodon, um, Byram and, and Darlow. Um, and I think as a clutch of four players, they're four good players for the, for the championship. But it will feel to people like there is more of what they don't want to happen happening so you know losing Harrison losing Verba Nonto trying to leave Adams looking like he he might have gone to Chelsea doubt about Sinistera than seeing what they do want to happen which would be players coming in through the door and I think if there was a bit more of a balance people would be able to sit and say it was never going to be immediately after relegation with a summer where you need a takeover you need a change in the recruitment department you need a new head coach you need massive churn in the squad um, and you've only really got you know three months in, in which to do that and only really two months before the season starts it was highly unlikely to be a dream was it um, but I think it could have been better than it has been What do we see at Ellen Road on Friday? Um, do we see a fan base that's right on edge? Is it going to be a bit more forgiving than perhaps the uh, the social media spheres? You tell me I feel like the mood will be generally forgiving but there's only so forgiving you can be when uh, you know there's a ball to the back post and someone taps it in I thought that the frustration level towards Yelda against Shrewsbury was quite instructive in that people, it feels like people on a, on a fairly, 
They're on a short leash, aren't they? They're, you need, the thing is, you need a bit of something, don't you? You need something to yeah. believe you in. Need here, a, yeah. You need a little bit back. And at the, those days at Ellen Road where sometimes the crowd starts on form, sometimes the players start on form, sometimes neither start on form, but at points you do get little turns in a game where there'll be a bit of a song gets going, there'll be a big tackle goes in, and it just it just feels like momentum turns. It did feel like momentum turned in the Cardiff game, actually, when, when we got that, that early goal from Cooper, and it felt like, oh, we might actually get, get something from this now. Yeah. But there's not been much of that for a couple of years. It's been generally just dire. Mm. I, I did. I thought Farker was again kind of hinting at his press conference yesterday that it could be a difficult game against West Brom, and, and I don't. I don't mean he's saying West Brom are quite good, so therefore it's difficult. I think what he's saying is, I have difficult circumstances again, which I'm I'm going to have to manage. Um, so I'm fairly realistic about the possibility that it might be a tough night. But you're right; he does have Rodon to come in. Um, Ruta will be fitter and more available and he is I mean having retained him and you know made a play of retaining him he has got to come good you know mm-hmm. he is, he's got to start delivering um, at some point soon um, particularly in the absence of anybody else obvious to well, play at I, night. I have been I have been teeing him up for his moment haven't I for bloody months now so at some point he's going to have a moment where it just sparks into life for mm-hmm. him Ruta Hattrick yeah when he's on loan at, back at Hoffenheim <laughs> I mean the other side to this is that as much as Farquhar is warning us and things have felt pretty bleak at times over the last seven days. We comfortably, comfortably held our own against Birmingham for the vast, vast majority of that game. It's the point I was making. Yeah, Yeah. even if it was unspectacular, we were still well in that game and and could ourselves, had we had any cutting edge, we could have won it. If your glass is half full, your team is that weak, your bench is that small, um, two goalkeepers on it, eight players, you're that far from full strength. I... (laughs) I think in the end, Birmingham probably just about deserved to edge that, but it was a terrible game, and I, I think 0-0 would have been um, pretty much about right. But you do like to say to yourself, if you can do that in those circumstances against Birmingham, then if you have signings and if your team is stronger and injured players return, then you get better, you know, and, and therefore you're, you're more able to, to compete. Um, but it's, it is, in this league, it's results on the board, isn't it? Well, to circle back to the very start of this show, which was should we actually talk about the West Brom game? What do you know about West Brom? Do, you, do we know enough about this division just yet? Or are we still dealing with our own crises? They, they've got some They've got some good players. They've also got players... I mean, I, I noticed Eric Peters in their squad, who seems like he was at Stoke about 100 years ago and is now 35. Um, but they've got a couple of players who we know, so they've got Moat, um, they've got Kyle Bartley as well, um, other decent players like Chalabar um, and so on. It looked to me like they were playing three at the back um, in the last game against Swansea. It's a good win, that. I think Swansea will be decent this season without being necessarily brilliant. Um, but they've been good under Corbin. You know, they've been a decent, decent side. And people remember that he was he was quite heavily touted for the job when Farker, Farker got it this summer. Um, good coach, done, done good stuff in the, the jobs he's been in. And what's your feeling going into this game? I'm... I'm... I'm almost creeping around to looking forward to it again as we say this early Thursday lunchtime because match day comes around. I think, do you know what? I... You've got to look forward yeah. to it. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah. It, it I, does, just it... I just don't see where goals are coming from is the problem. Because I, yeah. atta- I think the attack will be largely similar to the Birmingham one. And I don't, I don't see there's much cutting edge there. I think Ruta comes back in, though. I agree with you on that. It, yeah. it feels, I, think, I don't think there's much cutting edge there. I'll say that again. <laughs> it, feels, it feels like he probably will. I can see it being a little late, the Birmingham game, actually, that it might not be flooded with chances, this game. Um, and it might not be particularly high scoring, but who knows? I mean, if that's the case, then that, is that good? I suspect that might be good if we can largely keep control of the game as we did against Birmingham. That that would, Rather than letting West Brom pass about, yeah. as Coburn probably wants to do. Not a bad thing. Not a bad thing. I think if you're if if you're as well drilled and I mean I was gonna say as settled as Bielsa's team in the championship. The weird thing about them was that they just seem to settle instantly. And that doesn't tend to happen too often. But if you are as well drilled and as settled as that, then you can be wildly aggressive and you can go for gold when it you remember when they used to be one nil up and they'd be trying to score in like the ninety fourth minute and <laughs> like, clinging to, I know you clinging to the press box going, Stop it. Like what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> but it's great fun, great fun to watch. I think from this kind of starting point, the standing start that Fark is in, control is so important. Um and there, there will be teams, coaches out there who are looking at Leeds at the moment and thinking they do look vulnerable. And they do look vulnerable. You know, if you go through the squad as it was at Birmingham, they don't look like they're you know, in any way ready at this stage um, for a, a full season. Um, but it will help him in no small way if structurally 
they, you know, they start to work themselves out. And is this where someone like Rodon can maybe come to the fore? Um, just that it's something something different to look at, isn't it? That's one of the things is that we've, we've kind of been relying on looking at the like. Even when you look at Rute, you, you're starting from a position of his fee and in making zero impression last season. So you're already kind of thinking about it in a negative frame of mind. Whereas you, you bring a new signing in like Rodon, it's just something different. It's someone new. We get to know a different player. Do you, do you remember um, how it was for Monk in the first month of the season? And he had Bartley, but it, it just wasn't like. It wasn't finalised, the defence. It wasn't finished. Then he got Janssen. And suddenly you had these two centre-backs who were giving you seven, eight, nine out of ten so consistently and, and so regularly. And it is the case in this division that somebody who can give you big performances at centre-back can make a massive difference. In the same way that I think with Ampadu, big performances in, in that area of midfield will help Leeds and, and enhance them. But it needs to be the complete package, doesn't it? And that's the point that at the moment, the team that Farke is, is having to pick or the squad that he's having to work with has kind of glaring holes in it. And that'll be his priority in the two weeks that are left, that when he gets to the end of the window, it it feels to him that he can he can field an 11 that he's, that he's very happy with. Yeah, that Monk side was not particularly good other than Rob Green really came into form. So those, those three as a defensive unit and Chris Wood up front. Chris Wood scored a lot of goals. Ailing turned out to be a massive find at right back. Um, Berardi did good stuff at, at left back. Um, it was a it was a very functional team, but it was very effective. And you don't need much to win games in this division. That's the thing. If you can have one, God forbid, two players who've got a bit of flair that can make things happen, it could be the difference, can't it? We didn't need much um, at Birmingham mm. to, to win that. They didn't need much. Uh, look how little card they've had, and you know they at that point at ninety five minutes in, they should have seen that out. You know they should have been able to have they got to the stage of thinking right. Surely Leeds have blown themselves out here. Let's just be sensible, do the right things. You know, get them over the line. Leeds deserve something from that game, hundred percent. But once you get to that stage of injury time, you kind of start to back yourself to to do it. Um. So you know those. Those two shots on goal. Can I, just say, can I just say that I'd really enjoyed. If you look back at that, if you look at the, if you watch the goals, you know it's been a late goal when all the players are on the floor holding their heads and stuff like that. Yeah. These are the things that I really like in football. Yeah, except you, when it's a Djukovic a penalty at St Andrews and <laughs> the same's <laughs> happening in reverse. Egg, but egg, yeah, no, no, you know right. that. Late, late Forget goals, the bad. Late, <laughs> late goals yeah. are the best. Yeah. Like they, they absolutely are. Um, so yeah, um, as I say, I, I think. The, the realist in you says it could be a could be a tough game this one I say Leeds win good I say unexpected again yeah not not but not capable of it just that nobody expects it so against expectations we will uh, we'll grind out a victory and it'll kick start the season next two weeks in the window go well um we have no legal disputes whatsoever with any more of our players. Why are you giving the side eye to Michael Phil? Michael, Michael's not having this <laughs> at all. I'm, at I'm all. hoping to summon the spirit of 96 and grind out a nil-nil. <laughs> <laughs> and then another against Ipswich. It'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it, if it was a really dull nil-nil at Ellen Road. I don't think anybody would know what to do with themselves because it's just We're so never, amp- amped up, never we? like that, is it? Yeah, We're Amped up on the football and the drama. Bring back George Graham. We shall see. Right, we'll get back together on uh, on Monday then and we'll uh, we'll pick apart what happened, yeah? And we'll speak then. The Square Ball Podcast. 